Quindi inizierò questo mio breve racconto proprio partendo dalla storia del luogo, il luogo speciale che ci ha eh, come dire, condotto, preso per mano e condotto in questo eh, lungo percorso che ci ha molto colpito, formato, ci ha fatto crescere, ci ha fatto crescere molto e quindi devo partire da Palazzo Fortuni e dalla sua breve storia. Я э, начну с описания того места, благодаря которому мы пережили много замечательных моментов, который э, благодаря этому, э, с, э, с, этому, этой встрече с, с Палацом Фортуни и мы э, сформировались по-новому и даже, можно сказать, выросли. И поэтому мое слово будет посвящено истории Палаца Фортуни. E qui cominciamo con una immagine che è datata 1892. E che come vi mostra, eh, come potete vedere, vi mostra un'architettura eh, molto rovinata, mh, abbandonata, con delle tracce di, del tempo molto, molto forti, molto presenti. И как вы видите, здесь э, э, выглядит здание неважно, э, выглядит заброшенным со следами, явными следами времени на фасаде. Innanzitutto il, il palazzo eh, nasce per volontà di Benedetto Pesaro. Прежде всего хочу сказать, что э, палаццо, этот дом возник, э, был построен Бенедетто Пезаро che è stato il capostipite di un'importantissima famiglia di commercianti che ha anche dato alla Repubblica, alla Serenissima, un doge, il centunesimo per la precisione. E un bel osnavazzile di una molto dinastia, una molto semestra in storia di Venezia, in storia di Svetlice Repubblica, che ha dato al governo del Sudarstvo 101 doge. Il Benedetto Pesaro commissiona questo, questo palazzo. Qui vedete un'altra un versione dove c'è già una, una trasformazione. Però commissiona il palazzo in un, in un lotto gotico, tant'è che l'architettura è uno degli esempi più interessanti, se non i più belli, del, di Venezia del, di questo periodo del tardo gotico. Il palazzo viene completato nel 1480. Uh... И когда Пезаро заказывал э, архитектору этот э, дом, он просил выполнить его в, в, в готическом стиле. И можно сказать, что этот палац один из значительнейших, если не самый значительный памятник Венеции позднеготического стиля. Это один из самых лучших примеров, как я говорила, для архитектуры тардоготики perché ha tra l'altro questa impostazione, questa particolarità di avere le sette finestre, cioè un'eptafora che è, una, è qualcosa di estremamente raro anche a Venezia. E questo che è molto raro possiamo vedere in Venezia è la sette finestre, è l'eptafora, tak nazivamo, и вот в этом дворце мы видим эти семь окон. И, respetto, respetto appunto alla parte architettonica, devo, devo anche dire però che da subito il palazzo, già nel 1522, viene segnalato come un palazzo molto importante anche per la grande collezione di arte contemporanea di quell'epoca che era presente nelle collezioni Pesaro. И я хотел бы, хотел бы отметить, что почти сразу же после окончания строительства, в 1522 году, об этом э, палацу говорили как об одной из самых ценных, э, места пребывания одной из самых ценных коллекций современного по тем временам искусства. И, secondo Marin Sanudo, che era un contemporaneo, e una, che nei suoi diari ci racconta e ci ha trasmesso anche la conoscenza delle opere alcune perdute della città ci rammenta che all'interno della collezione c'era per esempio un'opera straordinaria di Giorgione, l'adultera. E, secondo i dati 
Pompieri di Марин Санудо. Марин Санудо, Марин Санудо, это такой хронист был соответствующий, соответствующую эпоху. Мы знаем о некоторых работах, которые были и которые утеряны в настоящее время. Например, там была работа Джорджоне «Женщина, взятая в прелюбодеянии». E insieme a Giorgione e tanti altri, tra cui Bellini, Pordenone, ma non vale la pena elencare, solo questo per dire che sin dagli inizi era un luogo, un'architettura che accoglieva l'arte. E там были другие художники итальянские с той поры, но не стоит их сейчас перечислять. Важно понять, что с самого начала в этом архитектурном сооружении это архитектурное сооружение содержало в себе искусство изобразительное. И qui voi vedete a questo punto vedete un po' l'evoluzione delle delle facciate. Allora, dalla prima del 1893, che è la data in cui Mariano Fortuni ed è la poi il secondo personaggio oltre al palazzo che è fondamentale per la nostra storia affitta la soffitta dell'ultimo piano. Это череда изображений, запечатлевших дворец в разные годы. Первая из них относится к 1893 году, когда в этот дом въехал, собственно, Фортуни, и там он снял чердачное помещение, помещение под крышей. Scusate perché dovendomi fermare perdo un po', perdo un po il filo. Prego, prossimo, dobbiamo fermarci per un po' di tempo. Comunque volevo dire che Fortuni affitta la, la soffitta dell'ultimo piano perché negli altri piani abitavano circa 250 persone. Fortuni ha fatto un po' di tempo per un po' Потому что э, в ту пору в этом здании, в, раз, в квар, поделенном на квартиры, обитало около 250 человек. Erano persone di povere condizioni che abitavano il palazzo, perché a partire dal 600 si esaurisce il ramo della famiglia Pesaro. Это люди довольно бедных, бедного сословия. Потому что где-то начиная с 17 века по мужской линии заканчивает с семья Пезаро. И il palazzo quindi subisce notevoli trasformazioni e diventa la, anche la sede di due importanti accademie musicali. И palazzo претерпевает значительную перестройку и в, в, в частности становится место пребыванием двух замечательных музыкальных школ. И quindi anche la musica è presente, c'è l'arte, c'è la musica e poi arriva Fortuni. Arriva e e qui vedete, ma possiamo possiamo andare avanti, come Fortuni ha trovato a un certo quando è riuscito ad acquistare il resto del palazzo. А да, так вот можно сказать, что это здание вместило в себя не только искусство, но и музыку. А потом появился Фортуни, и сейчас мы можем видеть на этой фотографии, каким нашел это здание Фортуни, когда появился в нем. И quindi qui vedete appunto la documentazione del del palazzo del del piano nobile del primo piano che comincia a essere vestito con i tessuti che Mariano Fortuni comincia a produrre all'interno del palazzo. Это фото относится к тому времени, когда Мариано Фортуни уже приобрел большую часть помещений дворца, палацо и начал работу по, облицов, по украшению стен тканями, которые сам он производил в этом палацо. Ecco, questo è appunto il padrone di casa, questa è sua moglie Henriette e questo è come vivevano e questa è la parte appunto del, del palazzo come era allestita all'epoca di, di, di Mariano Fortuni Mariano Fortuni che è stato innanzitutto pittore ma anche inventore uomo di grandi curiosità 
Мы видим на этих фотографиях самого Мариана Фортуни и его жену. И можем сказать о том, можем наблюдать за помещениями палацо в ту пору, когда там жили сам Мариано Фортуни и его жена. И следует сказать о том, что Фортуни был прежде всего художником, изобретателем и человеком чрезвычайно любознательным. Che si è occupato innanzitutto di luce. Это был человек, наделенный многочисленными талантами. Занимался он главным образом светом. Ed è a lui che si deve la rivoluzione dell'illuminotecnica teatrale. И благодаря ему во многом произошла революция в осветительном деле в театре. E i suoi studi, il suo sistema che fu brevettato all'inizio del Novecento a Parigi, che si deve proprio a quello che oggi noi vediamo, le luci a teatro. E grazie ai vorbitori di sistemi, rappresentati nel inizio del XX secolo a Parigi, noi possiamo vedere oggi in teatro la situazione del mondo che, come pravilo, c'è lì. Ma adesso penso che non vi racconto tutto, ma vi invito a venire al, al palazzo a visitarlo, perché pur avendovi detto che non parlo volentieri in pubblico, ma quando si tratta di fortuni e, di pala e del suo palazzo mi sgorgano le cose. Avrei molto da dirvi, ma altrimenti tolgo il tempo al eh, motivo per il quale ci troviamo qui, quindi... Direi che vado verso la chiusura. Le immagini che scorrono dietro sono il palazzo. Io magla be se ho cin dolga gavarit o dvarce. Io ho scazzato che io non ho cin privicla gavarit na pubblica. Ma quando io gavarit o dvarce fortuni, to io tiraio se ho tempo. A nada oggi per andare a altri cose. Я приглашаю вас посетить этот это палац в Венеции и убедиться в его в том, что этот палац действительно прекрасен. Ecco, adesso allora io vorrei Allora io adesso vorrei passare a all'inizio a dare il via a passare la parola ad Axel Vervor che ha dato l'inizio della, del nostro viaggio durato dieci anni. Сейчас я передам слово Аксель Верволю, который инициировал, собственно, наш дал отмашку нашему пути, который продолжался десять лет. Egli la darò anticipando e annunciando la prima mostra che ha segnato la partenza, ripeto, di questo lungo viaggio. И передавая ему слово, я расскажу о той выставке, которая ознаменовала собой начало этого пути. Nel quale abbiamo per questo primo viaggio sono stati fondamentali i compagni di viaggio che io devo ricordare qui perché uno è anche presente che non vedo ed è Jean Hubert Martin. И для того, чтобы рассказать об этом еще, для того, чтобы представить. Я должна сказать о спутниках своих сказать. Вот в частности один из них Жан Марте, который вместе с Тез Виссером, а Джан Доменико Романелли, Джан Доменико Романелли, обязательно Аксель Вервот, Аксель Вервот, и первый Манкио, и в последнюю очередь я. Abbiamo dato vita a questa grande esperienza. Все мы вместе дали жизнь этому. E adesso passo la parola a mio fratello Axel Vervort, che vi racconterà il resto meglio di me. Grazie. 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 And see me, and saw my collection because I'm a bit born like a collector. I started collecting when I was seven, I think, with finding little stones, little things. And when I was 14, I went my own to England to buy art. And and when I was 21, I uh, was collecting more old pieces and 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 things that I think to 
that really touched me and that I thought that, that created a world which did not exist anymore. But at 21, I discovered a friend who became a big friend, Jeff Ray, and, uh, one of the Zero Group of uh, the most important painter of all this Zero Group that happened in the 60s. And he made me know of Luigi Fontana. And this happened was in 69. And the dimension of the void and, and uh, um, really struck me very much. And for me, that was the real missing part, which I did not find in the old art. And uh, I became very quickly excited. But for me, it's not like there's old art and there's contemporary art. For me, art is art, and it is timeless and it's a search for the universal and for things that are always universal and that always be actual. There's many Egyptian artists, many early artists that, that for me is sometimes more contemporary than things made today. And um, so all this experience was normal for my life and it's Matthias who said, you should do an exhibition. And okay, I th he convinced me to do an exhibition. And I said, but I think the exhibition should be in an old palace with ruined walls. And, and it should also be somewhere where there is also contemporary art. I think it's the, very important to this combination. And then I say, yes, then it should be Venice and should be during the Biennale and that would be ideal. And I went to the mayor of Venice, and it was a long story, I won't tell it all. But then he said, yeah, okay, after a long discussion, uh, I, he asked me, what do you want? I think, I would like something like Palazzo Fortuni. And he said, okay, you can get Palazzo Fortuni. But then I see there is the second floor. Uh, this, uh, well, I, I go just a little bit back. This floor, with all these damaged walls, which I loved, and for me was the very important theme of the concept of where old art and modern art comes together, and where an old wall is to me abstract art made by time. It's only the time who can make this. And the mayor said, it's impossible, it's not restored, you cannot show this to the public. And then I convinced him, this is exactly what we need to do. And then as I had no experience in curating, uh, very quickly I knew Dalia Ferretti and then John uh, uh, Romanelli and then we said we need an other important curator and why don't we go to the top of the world and we asked Jean-Hubert Martin. Uh, and it was a wonderful story of all together uh, where it started and uh, to, to bring all these art pieces together. I think I might go back to the beginning. Oh. Sorry, it doesn't go so. Uh, one more with Elena Itsui. I think Elena Itsui was quite important shock. Uh, you know, uh, we ordered, in those days he was not that known, we ordered a huge piece because there were scaffolders, they were restoring the palace. And for hiding the scaffolders, uh, he made this fabulous curtain. I loved it because it looks very Venetian. I love it because it's from recuperation. It's also made by time. You know, it's it, they're cleaning. People in Ghana were starving and gave a lot of work to those people. So he saved people. It's ecological. And he turns these lit things with how to throw away and make a jewel. It creates gold. So it's a very alchemistic idea. And I still remember when it was all done, and then uh, he was mounting it together uh, with my son and with some other, well, and he said, oh, in a way, it's, it, he said, it's a pity, all the facades is totally hidden now. And he said, okay, I'm gonna make some holes in it. And he went on scaffolders and he made all the holes uh, in that work uh, to, to make it part of this, uh, all this art tempo concept. And then our big master was Pierre Pacioli, you know, who learned uh, mathematics uh, uh, and uh, uh, a painting that's in Napoli. Every, every exhibition we wanted to have it, and every time we thought, now nah, we're going to have it, and at the end it didn't work. So we all have to go to Napoli to see it. But so here you see uh, the mixture. This palazzo, the idea was 
Fortuny lived there. He was a very multiple artist and, and a collector. So I think it's like we consult him how he can continue his collection. So we put that beautiful uh, gold fontana mixed with uh, his art, because on, on the wall on the back is mainly all paintings by Fortuny. There's this big elephant here that came from the National History Museum. It's like a sculpture made by time. It's because I think this exhibition is a lot about art that doesn't mean to, that doesn't want to be art. It's just the time it made it. And there's a lot of objects about time, too many to talk about it, uh, which was in this showcase. And oh, sorry. <laughs> And there was a long discussion for this room. Till the end, sometimes it's a difficult way to achieve what it is, and at the end it becomes one of the most beautiful things. So I had this wonderful sculpture, already a long time in my collection, it's from about 1160, it's a port of Loan. You know, it's a human being who achieves the highest level of enlightenment, and how to combine it. And we had several propositions, but at the end she said, let's do it with Opalka. And we had the voice of Opalka talking. And then I talk about it, we show it to Opalka, and he said, no, it's not possible, because I'm not Buddhist, I'm against religion, uh, it's, it's impossible. But then I convinced him and said, this is a human being, it's not a god, it's a human being that, that was in deep meditation and that did get... Uh, 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 and to combine it with your, because I think he's the writing the one, two, three while he's talking in Polish, and it's almost like a, a Zen mantra when you hear it. And it's, I think, very important to, for me, these excited things always existed. Uh, it's like a thousand years of difference, but in a way, it's very close to each other and to rediscover that. And, and for me, it's also very important to discover the spiritual part, the, the, even if it doesn't belong to any, any religion, but the spiritual part of contemporary art. Oh, sorry, yes, this is the, the oh, I'm sorry, I'm not so good this way. But this is a real mixture, but I think very much uh, explaining what was Artempo with a, a painting uh, by, uh, uh, no, Buri, uh, Graubner, uh, uh, Compressed César, and the, all the pottery is 12th century Khmer. It's a miskillen oven, but I think that was not meant to be art. But today we look at that art because I think we have learned from Armand and from César the compression. So there, for me, there's a timeless dialogue, and which I think will always come back. So I'll. There's a tapies, you know, and, and a sacco buri on these fantastic old walls. And for me, the walls I like frescoes made by time. It's impossible to make, to copy this. It's, it's a unique, like it's impossible to copy a great work of art. I think it's also impossible to copy an old wall. That's why I always think, hopefully, they will never get enough money to restore Venice completely because then it will look like Disney World. I love it with the peeling walls, with all the old walls. Uh, I think that makes Venice Venice and makes it unique. And after that idea of Artempo, I was in Japan. And I was so full of Artempo, I thought I would die. It was something very special, something new in my life that, that happened. So it's a, uh, the end and a new beginning. It's a very special feeling. And, from, and I went in the, the workshop of Noguchi, where there were all these unfinished sculptures, and I realized they were even nicer than those who were finished. And from there, I said, I think with Artempe, we didn't say everything. I would like to do an exhibition where the uh, non-finished is showing more infinity than anything else. And, uh, then I, from there I call to Daniela and I say, Daniela, are you agree? Shall we do another exhibition about uh, infinity? And, and she immediately said yes. So this was decided in Japan. But then I think for to really understand the infinity, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little, can, I'm, 
uh, we, 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 we have an exhibition in between, uh, which is academia. I think to understand the nothingness, the void, the fullness of the void, uh, the spirituality of that unfinished, I think you need to go to a learning process. Uh, which is academia, and we called it qui es tu. So we question ourselves, you know, from Plato. Huh? And uh, this was a very, quite a figurative exhibition. Sorry. Oh, I think I need some technical help. Oh. <laughs> so you see it here, this mixture, because these are all the plasters. It's a bit, a bit like the Pushkin Museum. There's a great collection of plasters that Napoleon collected uh, to expose there. And I, we brought, you know, then uh, real art with it. You see on the left, uh, Natura Fontana. You see, uh, uh, you know, um, a Gombli in, in the middle. Uh, there is a, a real Roman culture. There's an Egyptian culture. Uh, so there's a lot. And this was very interesting, this dialogue between the real and the old instead of the opposite, you know. The, but the old were copies of plaster. And you really felt very much the power of the real art. We put it, let's go. Huh? I'm sorry. Huh? I don't understand. And I don't see you with the lights. <laughs> Ah, okay. <laughs> oh, that helps. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so you see, it's a combination of a, of a cabinet amateur, like a study uh, of all times. There's even Fazarelli, archaeology, uh, uh, objects of all life, because I think our life is made of uh, some of so many impressions, of so many things we lived in, and and. Uh, I personally think to the search of this universal knowledge uh, is very important to understand uh, out of all times. Hmm? And there is infinitum. Hmm? And for every uh, exhibition, uh, we, it's like every two years, and also for academia and our tempo, but we did even did more uh, afterwards. We organized several think tanks, salons, uh, uh, to prepare the theme. And in the think tank science, we have a great scientist, we have uh, somebody who knows uh, uh, sacred architecture, uh, there's a, a Japanese person who is more philosophical, uh, there's uh, musicians, because I think music in every exhibition has been very important. And uh, also how uh, science, the perception of science of the void, when you understand Fontana and Infinitum, the void is very important, and there's a fullness of void, but which I think is so fascinating when uh, Fontana made this in uh, 1959. He said the void, the, the, with the material is, is, which is not there is more important than the material itself. And it's fantastic, like 50 years later, science discovered that we all come from the void. Before the Big Bang, there was a total void. And then we combined Fontana with Shiraga. It's a great Shiraga. Shiraga is one of my favorite artists, which I only discovered in 2003. And it's been also unbelievable, uh, how could I say, evolution in my life to discover the power of Fontana and the extraordinary freedom and the spiritual richness and, and all in a gesture that is because from Shiraga, he was contemplating the empty canvas. And when one says Picasso also did this, because I know Picasso sometimes put the date when, when his thinking process started, and sometimes he only painted two years later. And, and uh, Shiraga did this the same. Till there was one with this emptiness in a deep meditation, and his wife would feel when this moment arrived, and she would uh, pour the paint, and he would have on this string in his, in, in his workshop where he was hanging, and he was doing a wang gesture because he was from a samurai family, very, you know, the, he could give power with very little uh, uh, 
personal or very little ego, let's just say, like he didn't want, he just did it. He, wanted, he, want, he was a brush of cosmic power. And I think there's few artists who have gone that far. That far. The, the, there's no uh, presence of ego. For me, it's pure cosmic power. And I think the, the Naturas of Fontana have that same, I think they're also historically in the history of contemporary art, in the same history of art, I think it's an important moment. And they did expose together in 1959 in Milano. So there you see again Palazzo Fortuni with a, an early still life from the school of Caravaggio, master of Harford. And, uh, and unfinished things in the calder. Uh, it's all about the infinity. In the front is a small Egyptian figure, which is non finished. It's a non finished Egyptian picture of, uh, of uh, 3,000 years old. And, and, some, and then it becomes so timeless and so contemporary in a way. We especially put it on, on, on furniture of uh, artist studios. To, to make it so timeless and not like an object you want to show and to make. Uh, uh, these are, is in the, on the top floor where you see the beautiful outside, uh, this triangle of the, uh, the church, San, San Benito next door, and then the Canova uh, port, uh, the model in the middle of the tomb of uh, uh, who's? Uh? Pizzano. Oh, Pizzano, you see. Pizzano. Oh, oh, Tiziano, Tiziano, uh, 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 Tom, huh? Yeah. And uh, the, in the front, the two works are by Hans Oderbeek. And then for Infinitum, we had a Japanese artist, which I like a lot, is uh, Sadiro Horio, is one of the last living uh, Gutai artists. Very, very free. He, He's also somebody, as he says, I cut the air, I don't paint, I just continue and do, do things. And then he uses stones and he pushes them. And it's extremely powerful uh, artist. And, and he did many performances during Infinity. He also did it with children and with other people. And I think it was a fantastic experience to have him. And the Guggenheim Museum also invited him to do the performance for the opening of the, the big Guta exhibition they did a few years ago. And for Infinitum, also with my Japanese friend, architect, which I, we are, we're doing a lot of uh, projects, he created that little labyrinth in the middle. Uh, most of them have seen it, but it's based on the concept of tokonoma. And toko means in Japan, the platform, and ma is framed emptiness is the emptiness in between things. So uh, normally in a, in a classical Japanese tea house, there's one tokonoma, but there's the first time, you know, it's a labyrinth creating of tokonomas. And, uh, and it's very strange to feel, it's very, very silent. Immediately you go in, it's a little bit like in a little temple, and every work of art has a different um, how would I say, intimacy and expression, then you would put it in another place. And to make it also for technical reasons, you had to wait late, light, but we made it from recuperation material. So we used all the wooden bricolis from Venice that were thrown away, that were broken or rotten at the bottom. We turned them upside down, that they were like the mirror of the water of Venice. And the walls were just painted with the earth of Venice, the earth of our garden. So, and there you see one of those tokonomas made from the recuperation material, this poor look but with a beautiful little hotko uh, and two great uh, uh, ceramics, uh, uh, tea balls from uh, the famous Raku. And Raku, that is a very traditional, for me, very timeless. It's a generation from 1560. Now it's uh, Raku number 15. It will be soon be a Raku number 16. So from one generation, the big are potters. So, and they prepare the earth and the glaciers for two next generations because they, use, they have to use the old earth. And it's all about emptiness. And raku balls are very, very valuable in Japan because the quality of the emptiness is better than a normal ball. And they judge also the, 
like they would say, like for us it will be in Anish Kapoor, uh, in Japan, in this culture, ceramics is the highest level of uh, being an artist. And I think that he did expose here in the Pushkin as well, yeah, the Raku family. But so it's interesting for me to see these very precious objects in a very raw environment where it's all about silence. And that's a Sai Twombly uh, sculpture and, and a Manzoni. Uh, but they have this poor look, which I sometimes like. Instead of putting all the spotlights on it, uh, I think you feel more the intimacy of the work and, and, uh, and it, they get a spiritual character. When, and when sometimes when they're too much with, uh, uh, on a show with too much in, in a too rich environment, I firstly, it's a different experience than, than, than this. And out of this, this infinity, the feeling of the emptiness, came quickly the idea of tra. Uh, tra means in, in, in Italian, uh, the distance between two things. This is the tra. You know, it's like into a door. It's in a still life. It's not the objects that count, like a beautiful Velázquez or whatever. It's the distance in between that creates magic. Also in music, when you a great uh, person who plays the, a piece of music, it's about the distance it creates in between the notes that makes it uh, a genius. So here you feel it's a Michael Bormans. Uh, with the red and the green hand above a table. So he feels that energy in between. It's giving body to things you can't see. I think and a lot of art I like very much is art that describes something you can't see, but you feel. Uh, also the Giacometti uh, is like, it's an old work of Giacometti, uh, is holding the emptiness. And, oh, sorry. That's was Anselmo, you, you feel that magnetism, you feel the heaviness uh, on the floor. It's also that energy you feel and you don't see. I don't know what is my time. But, oh, so we'll have a few minutes. No. This Anish Kapoor decided to have this for this exhibition. It's kind of a door where the energy again in the middle is very special, like vibrating. And on the, on the wall you see an Egyptian door of a closed door like a hidden door. There's, there's always a dialogue between old and new. There's a, a deeper meaning, and I think it's one plus one is more than two when you put those two things together. It's like, I think when you, you have, you're a good host and you bring very many different people together, you bring eight different people together who don't know each other, and after the dinner, they all l like each other, inspired by each other, and I think they all add to each other. And that, uh, a friend of ours, Gunter Uecker, which I think is a great artist, a living artist still, he created this uh, for the Chernobyl disaster, and he wanted that also for a tri exhibition. But again, it's about the energy you feel of the weight. And that's Uecker, and, and it's about the beginning, it's uh, uh, early Opalka. The, f the last piece he made before he started with his numbers, and that's a pyrography. It's, uh, uh, Mesopotamia is very old, it's about 4,000 years old. And, and then after that idea came uh, the uh, idea Proportio. You know, I think Proportio is also about emptiness, but it's another way. It's more a mathematical way of thinking uh, what, how you can give body to emptiness. And uh, there's a wonderful example in, here in Russia, in St. Petersburg, the, the streets, the, the height of the buildings and the width of the street is the golden section, the em that emptiness. And it creates a real magic when, when, you, when you see it. And, uh, but I think we, we, was, we were organizing all the think tanks with scientists, with specialists in sacred architecture, it was fascinating. But we quickly realized that two years was not enough to prepare this exhibition. Unless all my life, not all my life, but still I was in my 20s, I started studying uh, the, uh, the sacred proportions and that. But it's such a vast element. And it's also something that was forbidden uh, to, 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 sh to tell to people. It was like a secret knowledge. 
and uh, even Blondel he was uh, made the, arch the school of architecture in Paris. He was not allowed to st to to teach it to his pupils because it was the uh, secret knowledge for the, the that. Uh, and then we said, but what there's we let's do something in between, and we said tapis because we like tapis and. I think the collection of that piece is fantastic. It's a private collection. It's very strange, as, as I'm a collector as well, you, you, I recognize when you see an old an Egyptian object or a Roman object or, or contemporary art, you can say, oh, this must be from that collection because through the choice of, of the object, you recognize the collector. And he's Los Guardo, Los Guardo del Artista, the le regard de l'artiste, the view of the artist, is the artist, do you recognize that taste? Huh? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so that's a bronze chair of Tapies, and with his eye, and the three eyes, the third eye. And there's a work of Tapies. And then Günter Uecker gave us this fantastic work he, he made when he was almost like, I think, 80 or over 80 when he made this work. He still has this unbelievable force to make work like that with no hesitation. And, and that's also a tapis. It looks more like a calligraphy because tapis was very inspired by Japanese art. It's one in one of the tokonomas in the pavilion and it's with a, a very early Zen vase of the 14th century. The terracotta, huh? and there came Proporcio. So Proporcio, we studied a lot, and then uh, we we studied about proportions, and then make it in a very uh, ecological material. You know, we made it from hemp and lime, but in pure proportions. I think I should show you the drawing, which is coming here. You see, you start uh, from there, you start, but uh, normally it's opposite, but we start now from there. Uh, the, the, the first pavilion is in the root of two uh, proportion. So there's the square. I think the story is, and this exists with the Aztecs, with the Egyptians, with, with our early history, the, there's a relationship between the square and the circle. The circle represents heaven and the cosmic power, and the, the square is the first manifestation, manifestation of a spiritual idea on earth. It's the mathematically one by one by one, divided by one, it always stays one, it's the one universe. Eh? So this, the whole sacred geometry is based on that principle. So and the, the, there is a square and you take the diagonal of that square, then you have the root of two uh, proportion, uh, which is the voluntary to go from the spiritual idea you receive, you want to go further. That's why root of two proportion is a proportion very often used for doors or for or to income halls, like all medieval village, all the uh, the big income uh, porches, you know, they were always made in root of two uh, proportion. So you, people could go through that and then they would discover the golden section proportion which represents a perfect harmony, the perfection uh, of harmony in the, in the cosmic. And then we have the double cube uh, pavilion. Double cube pavilion is very intellectual. And in a way, there's 12 times the golden section in it. So it's a very good proportion, uh, a Palladio, a proportion of Palladio, open f very much, and all the followers of Palladio, they always, their main room was always a, a double cube uh, proportion and then the Egyptians, and then the next door is the root of five proportion. It's a proportion the Egyptians uh, used a lot, mainly for entering the sacred places or the sacred place. But the really very sacred place was like the last one in the root of three. It's also the triangle. It's the, it was only reserved uh, for a spiritual for a place uh, uh, for, for, for uh, for, for yes, for God, for God, whatever, uh, the, um, and this was the big. And then we were thinking which piece of art, because normally we have to combine things, and the, the discussion till the end we decide we put nothing in it. The proportion itself is much more strong than anything we add in it, and the people who walk through it, there will be the art, and uh, and I think it was an experience many people liked very much, and and then Michael Bormans. Uh, 
when I was in Italy and I was in this Palazzo Te and saw these huge horses, I think my dream would be to have a portrait of my horse. And, uh, and from there, I phoned to Michael Boromans and he said, okay, it's a great idea because I just, that's already five years I want to paint a horse. And it took him three years to paint uh, this horse, this, uh, uh, his, his Lusitano stallion, but he made it even bigger than in real size. And I think it's a marvelous uh, object of uh, uh, proportion. And Vasarelli is very much about proportion, but I'm going go with great. I think this combination, was a beautiful Biotticelli, huh? uh, which is totally, it was in root of two proportions, very strange, and he painted the black part, and the blue part is pure on the millimeter golden section. And then the blue Jefferayen, which is 1962, on the left is also pure golden section. And personally, this dialogue really was for me very fascinating and, and uh, and even emotional when, when I discovered this while measuring it. And then there's uh, Anish Kapoor. It's about the proportion of all these different grays and creating the empty space. And then together with this fantastic Giacometti uh, cube, uh, also formed again a very good dialogue of, I think it's also the theme of proportion of going from the square to the, to the cosmic, I think it's here as well, from the, the material itself, like a prisma, like a, a rock crystal, uh, going into the, uh, the, the, uh, the, yes, the cosmos with its no material anymore. It's about emptiness. And that's a view on Venice with the Marca Virkela object where you see it. And, and that's, an, uh, I have to go. Out of that came intuition. And after many salons, it was a, perhaps one of the most deep going and fascinating think tanks uh, we had. We also had wonderful people. And we, the experience of uh, finding all these menus, mainly Daniela, went to all the museums to find this very, all of, I think, the beginning of our culture. It's the, as old as you can get of human sculpture. Uh, they're they're uh, uh, pre-dynastic, um, pre they're about the uh, Iron period, about the uh, third millennium BC. Hmm? And from the beginning, I thought for intuition, I'm not such a fan of Basquiat, but I have a very good friend who, uh, who had a great Basquiat collection. They collected it when Basquiat was not known at all and I knew this Basquiat. And I think this Basquiat we absolutely need because for me it's about guts feeling. It's about, it's so strong, it's so without bounds. It's really something like, it's uh, for me another new beginning. It's like with going from the essence of our body. And we were, it was a strange experience. We were unwrapping it the other side of that wall and we unwrap it and say, ooh, it's too strong, it might kill the miniers. And we put it around the wall, and we put it in that wall, and we were so shocked. For me, I, I had tears in my eyes, and I think, and I wanted to phone the owner how beautiful it was, and I couldn't find words for it. It was so touching. I rarely had that experience that something was so touching being together that way. And there, for me, is the ultimate way of bringing old and new together. Because since then, I understand Basquiat much better, and I really think he's an absolutely major artist. And then Anish Kapoor, I always liked Anish Kapoor because I think he's perhaps the most important artist who gave body to the void. You feel the void, and that's an old work of him from the 90s. And it's difficult to photograph it because here you're in front of it, it's like an endless tunnel of light. I always think it's the, w it's the moment between going between dying and living. And I think it's like the heavy, you, you enter in an endless tunnel of light and where there's no time anymore and there's no limits. And it's that feeling you got. And then in the Palazzo Fortuni, in the ground floor, there's a room which is a little bit like a Romanesque cellar. So we made it and you really had that feeling. And you don't see on this picture, but I added a beautiful medieval uh, uh, Sintana next to it to create that almost religious feeling 
understanding Kapoor is beyond religion, but for me it is religious. And for me the spiritual, and for Daniela as well, you know, the spiritual experience of contemporary art is very important. It's not just uh, uh, the, the conceptual, it's, uh, and that's a work that's arraigned curtain by Anviron de Cayanza uh, in front of a, of, of a video, but it was like a, a fountain appearing made from thousands of shadows of all kinds of uh, civilizations, statues, one on put on top of the other uh, by the American artist Kuz Ralske. Uh, is about that universal shadow. He calls it the universal shadow. Very exciting piece. Oh yes, and we had it together, because music is important, we had it together with the uh, early music of Gesualdi, huh? and I think uh, it was also the beginning of that type of music. So it's always bringing beginnings of the 15th century to beginnings of, uh, of the 20th century together, and they feel very familiar. Huh? And then about intuition, uh, Marina created this piece of the exhibition. We did the whole room for it. Here's Marina with her ex-husband. Huh? It was quite uh, touching as well. They met in Fortuny huh? uh, to do this performance for the opening uh, uh, of our exhibition. It's with rock crystals. It's the power of rock crystal. Rock, rock crystal is also cleaning the spirit. But that's something already for in many civilizations, for many ages, uh, uh, they, they, they know this. And then, very much, when we talked about in, intu intuition, at one we were together, Daniela and one, we never talked one word about it, and we were sitting, why don't we stop with intuition? It's a great idea, I think the same. And I filmed my son, I said, Boris, we just decided, going, and I said, I also thought the same. So it was wonderful that, and intuition at once was such something that was so deep going that it was difficult to go further in the Palazzo Fortuni. And I think it's a moment to do other things. And, uh, and then, uh, and, and, and that's who he made this piece, the end and the beginning, it's called. Huh? So it was very appropriate uh, to hang it now inside the Fortuni Palace. And we started with the Elanetsuni outside the palace. And, and so, and then Uke, I think my time is over, no? Yes, over, so I have to go a little quicker. So this is the music performances. Every exhibition, we have music performances. Also, it's always music written, especially for the exhibition, by uh, Marie Capel, who is there sitting in the middle. She creates for every exhibition uh, 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 music on a very special way. Uh, and then we had uh, Kim Soja, he, uh, who was making this archive of mine. So everybody had make a little ball of earth. Everybody could choose his own earth, different color. And so the end was full of earth, this arc of mine. But it's so strong that we moved the whole exhibition except this because it, it has to stay, the archives have to stay. So it's still in the palazzo and it uh, might be seen later. Hmm? i just tell you a little bit if you have time about outside the canal, that's why was one also the reasons I stopped with uh, doing, create, curating exhibition, which takes a lot of time, so because we are not just finishing this complex, uh, where we have beautiful buildings, and we have beautiful exhibitions now, and that's in one of the buildings, we have a uh, Kim Soja exhibition with me, reflecting all buildings, it's quite fascinating, you have to go inside to really realize the the magic of it is like, uh, we call it Escher because it, it feels like Escher. And there's a very meditative place, it's almost like a temple. It's very high, it's six meters high, solid columns that were supporting huge grain silos. And you feel that weight and you feel the silence. And inside is a collection of uh, eight, six to eight century Dvaravati sculpture. And it's also a beginning. They were the first monks who preached Zen Buddhism. They escaped from India, 6th to 8th century. They were in danger for political situation. A lot were then killed. They escaped in North Thailand and went and preached like that uh, till they arrived in Japan uh, for the Zen Buddhism. 
that their, the old chapel, which was a 19th century chapel, not terribly nice, and uh, it was made by the patron of this, this great uh, brewery uh, that, uh, to, that the priest should tell all, his, uh, uh, all the people who worked there they shouldn't drink too much. <laughs> that was the purpose of the chapel. But so we transferred the chapel now in a beautiful uh, James Terrell chapel uh, where the light is changing and and that's one of the little streets in this complex of uh, houses uh, and, and breweries and factories. It's all little area. One of the galleries, this is newly built with only north light. There we have an exhibition, here's an exhibition of Gierke, uh, you know, a German artist of the 60s, 70s. And then we have another gallery. We have a quite historical exhibition of Murakami. He's one of the founders of the Gutai work from the late 50s and 60s and early 70s. And that's uh, the Hendro. It's, a, it's, a, it's under the ground. It's a museum under the ground where, where I think art really, it's on those dark walls. It, it is very silent and very, uh, very spiritual. And there's one big room uh, only for three Rechiragas with only daylight. And then we have one building in the center, uh, which, which is one of the earliest uh, big works Anish Kapoor made uh, uh, in 95. Uh, uh, well, thank you very much.